according to St. John in the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all of the else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Children, no. This is an interesting text, especially because it's Good Shepherd Sunday, because it doesn't sound very shepherdy to start the whole thing. We have to look at this and think in terms not only of what we've heard, but the text that came before this particular reading, because what has happened is Jesus has gone and he's cured somebody on the Sabbath. And this is observed, you see, by the Pharisees, and they have an option at that point. They have an option to say, well, will you look at that? Isn't that something? He got cured. But no, they go straight for the fact that he broke the Mosaic law. You're not supposed to be doing things on the Sabbath. And Jesus just looks at him and he kind of shakes his head, I can't quite believe this. And then the conversation starts going in the competition of how you interpret this. Some people will say, well, he, he, he's crazy, he's insane. He has a demon. Then others say, but wait, if he's got a demon, how can he be doing the things he's doing? I mean, this is not demonic stuff, clearing people. And a great conversation is going on. And you can almost feel the crescendo in John building to this morning's text in John 10. And that's why when he thinks about writing this, it's the festival of the dedication, better known to us as Hanukkah. And it's winter. You even set the scene of what the weather might be like. And he's walking into the temple, and some of them get to Jesus, and it's almost like they can't take it anymore. Will you please plainly tell us, are you the Messiah or are you not? We want to hear it yes or no. I don't want to hear any other type of conversation going on. Yes or no, tell us Jesus. And he just looks at the whole thing, and once again, I have told you, not with yes or no. The works that I do in my Father's name, that's what testifies to who I am. You do not believe because you don't belong to my sheep, because you just can't give up your old way of thinking. That old way of thinking that ties you to the possibility that nothing can happen outside of your laws, your rules, and your regulations. And yet, funny thing is that most of the time, that's how life really is, isn't it? You just can't pull them into it. But then, but then, he goes into shepherding. Listen, he says, my sheep hear my voice. They're not debating whether what I did on the Sabbath was right or wrong. They hear, and when they hear, there is trust, there is safety. And because of this, they will never perish. No one's going to take out of my hand what the Father has given me. No way. And that invites us, really, in many ways, to kind of look at our lives and see, you know, what's been going on, what we're doing, how we put them together. And from a daily living type of standpoint, and, and I find myself, I have to kind of constantly look for reminders about what this shepherding thing is all about. Because I have this tendency, I don't know, do you too? To kind of think that you kind of ruled your life in ways, and then all of a sudden life comes 
crashing in on you when you least expect it, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. But there are those moments of time when it's so negative and it's so painful and it's so hurtful, and in your anguish, you want that feeling of safety. Somehow that knowledge that in the middle of all of this, I'm not alone. Because there's nothing worse than being alone in that moment, feeling so utterly helpless. I, I remember that once when I was kind of keeping guardian with a mother, father, and brother watching their brother die in New Hampshire. And after it was over, I had to go to a phone booth and call the council president, kind of a version of my, our sin today, and tell him that the long vigil was over. And there's no cell phones back then. This is a few years back. So I'm in a phone booth in this hospital and I'm dialing the number, and all of a sudden, and I don't know how, why it happened, I just kind of fell to the bottom of the phone booth, and I felt so alone. Abandoned. I watched a 20-year-old, talented young man die, and I was caught in that great conundrum of why. Why so young? Why so promising? Watching the anguish of parents his brother, and I had never felt more alone in all my life. It was as if the anguish of seeing this whole thing happen was so crushing that at that moment I wondered, why? But I had to get up and I had to make the phone call. I had to do what I was called to do. I went back to the family, and there's silence because there's not much to say at that point, is there? Except, after sleeping in chairs for three nights, in the same clothes, we all leave, we go home, they start making arrangements. And so, when you have to do a funeral for a 20-year-old like that, you stop and think of what you want. What do you want to say And all of these college students, and they're all packed into the church too, and they've never experienced the death of someone of their own age, only people who were older, and that was, of course, acceptable. And so, of course, we use the 23rd Psalm. Now, the good thing about this is that the young man who died was one of those type of kids who was part of the youth group, did all kinds of fun things, was always part of the church, and as a result, I had to go to that psalm as my resource. And that resource was for this young man, a shepherd, because he had already gone through almost three years of chemotherapy, radiation, even to the point of going to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and having a special chair custom made that fit the perfect proportions of his body so that when they did radiation, the radiation would hit the perfect point in his brain tumor. And at the end of the three years, their parents' health insurance cap was exceeded. That cap was a million dollars, and it went way over that. But through all of this, he really didn't like to be fussed over. And he didn't like it when his mother and father were talking about him to other people. And I remember Leslie and I talking to his mother when we were up at camp, and he knew what we were doing, and he kind of just looked at us like, stop it, I'm still here. And so it was that, that evening at camp, we had a bonfire, and he was off in the distance, and we were listening and we were talking about the 23rd Psalm. And he just sat at a distance and he listened to all the conversation. He didn't join into it. But I would imagine at that time, because they had exhausted all possible medical intervention, that he listened quietly to that psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even when anything else <coughs> fails, when I have gone through what I am through, I know that somehow great pastors belong to me. And this thing that I call cancer is the enemy, that in front of it I am anointed with all of God's grace. 
and then looking out into his future, so I'm sure it's certain to take some kind of strength for those words that surely goodness and mercy would follow him all the days of his life. And so we laid him to rest, one who heard that psalm over and over again, and there was never this consternation about who Jesus is. Tell us plainly, are you the Messiah or are you not? It was part of his whole life. Why was that? Because there was a congregation that took him in as a toddler, put him into preschool Bible, singing little songs, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. Going through grades one, two, six, seven, all the way up to confirmation, doing the confirmation program part of youth groups, going through all of that, and I began to think how important it is to remember the safety of what shepherding is all about. It was not God just shepherding him. God gave him friends, colleagues, mother, father, and a whole congregation so that when that time came where we had to release him to the God that loved him, to the shepherd who took him into his kingdom, that I began to realize shepherding is all of our business too. We have the ability, you see, to do what <coughs> Jesus did, to shepherd one another in some shape or some form that allows people to say, I'm not alone in this moment. Because any moment you almost can find yourself feeling that God isn't with you, abandoned. And it is at those moments of time that every community such as ours says, you are not alone. I will reach out to you because I need shepherding too. And I have read the 23rd Psalm and I believe those words. And I take those words, maybe not so much in reciting that Psalm to you, but rather just sitting and listening to you. Talk to me. Tell me what's going on. I don't know if I can solve it, but I can know and tell you that I've heard that 23rd Psalm also. And I am here with you. And it is beautiful. And because of that, on Good Shepherd Sunday, we have sung it, and I love singing it. But I would like for us now to go back to that song in your bulletin, please. <coughs> Let's just take one last look at it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. And when I am distressed, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And over against the turmoil of the world, he bids me to lie beside still waters. And when I am crushed by life, you restore my soul, O Lord. And when the pathways seem so crooked, you guide me along right pathways, and you do it for your name's sake. And when the darkness of life comes around me and I think you are gone, even though I walk through that valley of the shadow of death, I won't be afraid. For I remember that you are with me. Your rod, your staff, the very strength of you, it brings me comfort. And when I hunger, you prepare a table before me, even in the presence of enemies who would do me ill. You take, you anoint my head with oil, just as the first kings of Israel were anointed. And my cup is overflowing, running over with graciousness in the waters of life. And as I remember these things, surely I remember the goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will recall the promise that you made after you were resurrected from the dead, that I shall dwell with you in the house of the Lord forever. Your father's house, your father's mansion, with all its many rooms, that gathers all of humanity from time past and from present and for all time to come because your love as the Good Shepherd exceeds anything that we could possibly imagine. And he gathers us together on a Sunday morning to sing our hymns, to take communion, the bread and the wine, and discover 
that we are indeed beloved sheep.